organisms in the phylum Cnidaria. And so you can see that there are generally two different types of, of uh, body forms. So we talked about the polyp, which is generally sessile and has its tentacles facing up, like the sea anemone. And then we talked about the jellyfish, where the tentacles are facing down and they're mobile and they swim and they create the current that pushes food into their tentacles. And so they would be mobile. But how do these organisms feed? Why are they called cnidarians? How do they eat? They're not technically filter feeders because they actually use their tentacles. So they're carnivorous. And so they actually reach their tentacles out and try to grab the food. But they did show that the jellyfish in its movement actually also moved the food to it. But remember, they have stinging cells. So they actually sting their prey, they paralyze their prey, and then they bring it into their digestive system. And they have a digestive system which allows them to eat large uh, food. So this is an example of a fish that is caught in the Portuguese man of war. Remember, I mentioned that this was not the Medusa, but this is actually a colony of polyps. But there are certain polyps that are going to release digestive enzymes, break this down, and then take it into um, the organism. And then the food is going to be distributed to the other polyps that do not um, have easy access to the food. Okay. Likewise, the jellyfish can actually take food into their gastrovascular cavity and digest it, but they actually have to spit the, the things that are undigestible out. Okay. So when we looked at when we look at Nigerians, one really important Nigerian it are the groups that is referred to as the coral. So the reason why these are so important is, is that they make up the ecosystem called the coral reef ecosystem. And this is essentially the rainforest of the ocean. Even though it makes up only 2% of the ocean floor, it is super important and super diverse in terms of number of species. They estimate that about 25% of all marine species depend in some way on coral reef um, ecosystem in order for, for to survive, so for shelter and for food. And so when we look at the coral, they are polyps. And so our, as polyps, they are carnivorous. Oops, carnivorous. So they feed on zooplankton. And I mentioned that zooplankton are really small little animals. It could also be like the larvae form of animals. And so they take these in and they use them as energy. But the other way that the polyp gets its energy, the other way that the coral gets its energy is it also has a mutualistic symbiosis. I can't spell today for some reason. Let me get that right. It has a mutualistic, which means both groups benefit. Symbiosis, which means two different species living together. So in this mutualistic symbiosis, they are have um, algae called that's sorry, zo and belly incorporated into their tissues. And it is the zooanthellae, which are algae, so they are not animal. And these, um, it is the zooanthellae that actually give the coral reef its bright colors. So if the zooanthellae are not present, then the coral will turn white. And that is what happens when we're, we're going to talk about this. That's what happens when you have cor or coral bleaching. 
is, is that the zooxanthellae are spit out of, they're actually uh, ejected from the polyps and the um, coral loses its ability to undergo photosynthesis. So this is an example of an acquisition of a foreign trait. So the coral gain the ability to get energy via photosynthesis. So there is carbon dioxide dissolved in water and this carbon dioxide can be taken up by the algae and with the um, use of light, they can produce sugars. So the zooanthellae provide sugars in this relationship. And the polyps provide another limiting nutrient, so they provide nitrogen. Algae generally are nitrogen limited. So whenever you see like in the, in the river even, whenever you see an algae bloom, that means that there's lots of nitrogen in the water. And it could be due to nitrogen fertilizer running off and getting into the river. And that can be a bad thing, but nitrogen that is provided by the polyps because they feed on animals. And then when they break down the animals, they produce nitrogenous waste. And then this nitrogen can be used by the algae to grow. So this is why it's called a mutualistic, that they both benefit from the relationship. So they have a calcium carbonate skeleton. The polyps do. And this is what actually builds the reef. So coral reefs are only near the equator where the water is warm. So, the water, so we wouldn't say that the um, off the coast of Oregon, that's not a coral reef. It's a, it's a temperate reef. So the coral reef is where it's, the water is warm and shallow, right? So shallow because of the building of the reef, and it is warm water. So we see the distribution of um, the coral reefs near those areas where, where we see that those situations in the environment. So oftentimes reefs protect mainland so if you think about off of the coast of florida right when uh tropical storms come in they hit the reefs first and that actually provides a buffer for the mainland if you think about the caribbean islands the, uh, the Caribbean, the, the reefs out in the shallow water actually help to protect, protect erosion from big storms. And then if you think about Australia, where we have the Great Barrier Reef, right, around the Australian continent, Australia is essentially an island, and that is going to pr protect the mainland, kind of buffer <coughs> to protect it against storm and erosion. So this is um, shows the individual polyps of a um, of of the coral, and then this diagram actually shows the zooanthellae that are actually located in the tissues. And so they're not outside of the of the coral; they're actually inside the individual tissues. And so I'm going to show you a little video that talks about what happens when we have a bleaching event. So coral bleaching is due to um, an increase in water temperatures. So this is due to the warming of oceans. And this is where the polyps eject 
the zoanthellae. And so it's actually a protective mechanism, as is explained in this video. And then the coral could possibly get recolonated by different algae, different zoanthellae, that might actually be more resistant to warmer temperatures. So we're actually going to watch two short videos that talk about this phenomena. First one. the one I want. Um... Corals are small animals, but they build structures that you can actually see from space. As we zoom in, we see the reefs where I work, a little island called Ofu in American Samoa. They ridge there, the edge is the coral reef. As we zoom in, we see what those reefs are. Now, the reefs are made of individual coral colonies, like we see now. That coral, then, is actually made up of a whole series of small polyps, they're called. This is a colonial organism. And the polyps themselves have all the structures that an animal needs. It has a mouth, it has tentacles, it has gonads, it can live, it can reproduce, it can grow. Uh, they're in a colony of genetically identical polyps. Now, the color of these tentacles, like I said, is not the color of the coral itself. It's the color of the symbiont. And as the focus racks in and out a little bit here, then what we see is that we can just see the little globules of the symbiont. Well, let's take a closer look. We'll go into a tentacle and see those. These cells, the symbionts, are not just floating around. They're actually inside the coral cells. Corals are simple. They just have two cell layers, an epidermis and a gastrodermis inside. The symbionts are inside the gastrodermis, and you can see it there. Now, this is an a life form called a dinoflagellate. It has chloroplasts because it's photosynthetic, but it has very odd-shaped chloroplasts, like these yellow structures here. We're going to zoom in to the chloroplast itself because that's where the damage happens during bleaching. What do chloroplasts have in them? They have membranes called phylicoid membranes. Those membranes hold the proteins called the photosystems that then capture light energy and turn it into chemical energy. It's the molecules that turn all of the sunlight that we get on the planet into the food that we eat. The rain of photons down here hits these photosystems and they, they gather them up. Now, if the temperature goes up and if the, the light goes up, then they freak out. There's too much energy. The photosystems break and they no longer can function the way they do. The rain of photon keeps going. The energy is still there. And as a consequence, that energy is now turned into reactive oxygen molecules. Those are damaging to cells. So it damages the inside of the symbiont, it damages the inside of the coral cell, and they spit the symbiont out. That spitting of the symbiont out by one coral cell isn't bad, but if the entire colony does it, then that's coral bleaching, which you can see here is simulated of the, the spitting out of these symbionts and the gradual whitening of this particular part of this particular coral colony. Well, when that happens across an entire colony, then the coral turns from its normal tan color into a white color. What difference does that make? The symbiont provides 75 to 80 percent of the energy the coral needs to survive. But without that energy, it can't make a skeleton and it can't live very long. So as a consequence, a lot of the corals that bleach eventually die. So you might have heard of uh, coral bleaching as it's related to the um, Great Barrier Reef, because in the last couple of years, unfortunately, like 90% of the Great Barrier Reef has become bleached in Australia. And so they're obviously super concerned because obviously it is worth a lot of money in terms of what the coral provides to fisheries, but also like to tourism and all kinds of other things. And so they're actually offering scientists money, research grants to try to figure out how to go about um, keeping the coral from dying, that great barrier reef. 
And so um, this guy that was just talking was just one of those people that um, was interested in doing some research. And so I'm just gonna play a little video that talks about his particular research. And I X'd it out, so I have to get it again. are one of the most spectacular ecosystems found in nature. Host to numerous biological communities, they are important havens of biodiversity. And a valuable food source for over 500 million people. But as Earth's climate warms, so do the oceans, bringing heat stress to coral communities. When water temperatures get too warm, coral species may respond by expelling their symbiotic algae in a process called leaching. Repeated or prolonged leaching can lead to the death of entire coral colonies. Marine biologist Steve Columby is studying how different coral populations respond to heat stress caused by warming oceans. He regularly travels to Ofu, a tiny island in Samoa, for his field work. Ofu Island and the lagoon behind the reef here is one of the best coral laboratories in the world. These back reef lagoons heat up to an extraordinary degree for a coral reef. They heat up to 32, 33, 34 degrees centigrade. That's above the temperature which most corals will leach and die, yet these lagoons are full of thriving, growing corals of many, many species. So the question is, how do these corals do it? How do they live in such warm temperatures? To answer these questions, Columbi and his colleagues conducted a controlled experiment devising a way to apply heat stress to the corals in the lab. First, we had to build a standardized stress tank so that we could expose corals from different parts of the reef to exactly the same stress. Columbia took corals of the same species from two different parts of the reef, one living in a warmer pool of water and the other in a cooler pool, and put them in the stress tanks. When grown and measured in these tanks, corals from the warmer pool were more resistant to bleaching. But could corals from the cooler pool become more heat resistant if given time to acclimate to warmer temperatures? Another experiment was needed. What was cool about corals is you can take them, break them into two fragments. They're genetically identical clones of one another. You can grow them in different environments and then retest them. Columbi transplanted corals from the cooler Ofu pool into the warmer pool. He let them grow for three years and then tested them again in the stress tanks. This time, the transplanted coral were more resistant to bleaching than their cooler ancestors, but still not as heat resistant as the original warmer pool corals. What makes the warmer pool corals more resistant to heat stress? The answer is in their genes. The corals that are living in the warmer pool have better heat tolerance genes, and so they have a leg up on heat tolerance that the corals living in the cooler pool don't have. So as a consequence of five, six, seven years of work now, we have found that corals can change their heat tolerance and acquire higher heat resistance. 
but that having the right genes helps too. A combination of acclimation and adaptation is what gives these Ofu corals such high heat resistance in the warmer places. Could these scientific findings be applied to saving or repairing damaged coral reefs affected by heat and other stresses? To answer this question, Columbia and graduate student Megan Morikawa have started another experiment. This initial project, this reef restoration project, is really a big experiment. It's a big scientific experiment to see if different species uh, transplant better than others, to see if different individuals within those species transplant better than others. Now the new spot in this case is across the mountain, the other side of the island at a, at a reef called Sealy. It was a beautiful reef. 20 years ago, it got slammed by a hurricane. Corals there all rubble. Suppose we try to restore that reef. And the experiment, which we've just started days ago, is to ask whether or not corals from the warmer part of the reef transplant and grow better uh, than corals from the cooler part of the reef. And uh, we'll monitor them over the next year to see who survives, who grows, uh, and then who grows best of all. So I've made it a goal of my career to try and bridge the gap between research sciences and real world application. And this is a project that is attempting to do just that. We're trying to bring a good project to a place that has special coral, that has the management agencies in place in order to understand the importance of the research that we're doing. So it's a very fortunate dissertation project to work on. I consider myself lucky every day. So one of the most important things that corals have going for them actually is that people around the world care about them. They recognize the productivity of reefs and the importance of that to the people that live there, the way they protect shorelines from erosion, their beauty, and that kind of attention, a like attention on tropical rainforests, results in people asking, well, what can we do to save these amazing ecosystems? That's a really important first step. Because with that kind of willpower and the intention of the world on the problem, then maybe we have a chance of fixing it. Okay, I'm going to turn the light back on. Okay, so we're going to actually do an experiment in um, class or in lab this week. It's not related to coral reefs, but it is um, experiment, and so we're going to talk about experimental design. So what did they alter in that experiment when they were looking at um, the stress takes in particular? What were they altering? So what, what were the two different types of coral that they put into a stress tank? Yeah, so coral that was from the warm pool. So he had kind of a natural experiment set up because he has pools that tend to be really warm and cooler pools. So he could take some algae or not algae, coral from a warmer pool and from a cooler pool, and that's what you alter. And then you would put it in the stress tank and then you would look at how resistant, if you heat them up, how resistant they are to bleaching. And so that resistance to bleaching would be what you would measure. And so they found that the warmer coral have some genetic um, advantage, um, but also that coral have a little bit of ability to acclimate. And maybe that has to do, the acclimation has to do with getting different symbionts and incorporating different zoanthellae into their bodies. Are there any questions about that experiment? No? Okay. So one of the other things that they mentioned in this video was coral reproduction. So I'm actually going to switch over coral reproduction. And so um, when we talk about animal uh, reproduction, we can talk about asexual. So this is without producing gametes. So there are no egg in the sperm and the offspring are genetically identical to the parents. And so they can bud. 
So budding. Right. So this is where a uh, adult polyp produces another polyp. And so here you can get a colony of polyps that are all genetically identical to one another. Okay, so that's what he was referring to as a genetically identical uh, colony of polyps. You could also have fragmentation. And he mentioned that in the video, that was a benefit to the researchers and possibly a benefit to coral reefs um, uh, restoration because you could just take a piece of coral. You don't have to take the whole coral. You can just take a piece of coral. You could break it into little pieces and into little fragments and they will all grow back into a colony. So those would be examples of um, asexual reproduction. And then we also have sexual reproduction. So this is the production of egg and sperm. Now coral tends to not be mobile, so it tends to stay in one place, but the larvae are mobile. So we have mobile larvae. And that is significant. So whenever we see in the animal life cycles, generally whenever we see sexual reproduction, the larvae are able to swim or they're able to move, they're able to disperse into new environments, and they are genetically different than the parents, right? So they disperse into new environments that they actually might be more genetically um, better at surviving in than their parents, right? So they disperse into new environments. So the way that the coral reproduce is, is that they spawn and they have these mass spawning events where egg and sperm are simply released into the water. And so if you look at, um, if you see a video of this, it actually um, kind of looks like uh, the, um, in the sperm, it looks like the, the, the uh, excuse me, the coral is actually smoking and that's the release of the sperm. And in this diagram, you can actually see this is a coral that is releasing eggs. And so the egg and the sperm are just released into the water, and then they have to come together. And so um, in order for a sperm to get to the right egg, the right species, there has to be some kind of chemical communication. So the egg probably has specific chemical receptors on it that allow the sperm to fertilize it. Because if you think about a coral reef, there's not just one species of coral in a coral reef, but there are many different species. And so it's probably reproductively isolated by the ability of the sperm to gain entry into the egg. And then the larvae swim off and then they form a new colony. So that is just an example of an animal that can easily reproduce both asexually and sexually. Okay, so we're moving on to the next phylum. So this one has kind of a funny name. It's called Platy Helminthes. And Platy, you might have heard before in the form of platypus, right? The platypus has a, has a flat, um, kind of uh, beak-like shaped snout. But Helminth means worm. So these are what we call the flat worms. So they are still bilaterally symmetric. So they have bilateral symmetry, unlike the Cnidarians that had radial symmetry. And they have cephalization. They're flat because that allows things to diffuse more readily into their body. So like they get oxygen by just diffusing across the surface of their body. And they don't, they don't have a circulatory system or a respiratory system. So they have this highly branched digestive tract that can deliver nutrients to all of the cells in the body. So that flatness is kind of a byproduct of how simple it has to be because there's not a lot of, of systems that do a lot of work. So when we look at um, this organism, it has an incomplete digestive tract like the jellyfish. Okay. 
So this means that there is only one opening. So the ancestor of the platyhelminthes was free living. And then it gave rise to some very specialized parasites. So this is my cladogram. And so this tells me that free living was ancestral. And I could actually put free living ancestor back there. So this is free living ancestor. These are free living. And there's a lot of diversity in marine flatworms. And I'll show you some pictures of them in a second. But then we also have the tapeworms and the flukes. Okay. So back here, we have a new trait, and this is being an endoparasite. So endo means that it lives inside of its host. It's different from being an ectoparasite, which attaches onto the outside of the host. So tapeworms and flukes are endoparasites. And tapeworms are so specialized that I'm going to put right here. I'm going to put that they have lost their digestive system. So the losing of their digestive system is a derived trait because the ancestor had a digestive system. Okay, so they become so specialized that a tapeworm living in the intestine of its host just simply absorbs the nutrients right across the surface of its body, and it doesn't need to do any of its own digestion. It does need to attach onto the host to keep from leaving with the feces, and it also needs to protect itself from the host's um, immune system, because our immune system and the immune system of other organisms does have the ability to fight off these endoparasites. So the example of the free living organism that we're going to look at is the planaria. So we'll look at that in, in lab, not this week, but next week. And so if we look at a diagram of the planaria, this is what it looks like. This is its anterior end, its head end. So it actually has structures called eye spots, which can't see images, but they can actually see light versus dark. So they can orient in their environment. And then they have these little structures right here, which are actually called oracles. And they're called oracles because they look like ears, but they don't, don't actually hear sounds. These are chemical sensors. So they're actually kind of tasting their environment. So the eye spots detect light. And then notice that they have this big digestive tract that extends throughout the body. Weirdly, their opening to their mouth is actually kind of in the middle of their body, and it's called the pharynx. And they kind of extend it like a vacuum cleaner hose, so they can extend their mouth out, and they can suck up nutrients. They're generally scavengers, and so they suck the nutrients up using their pharynx. So their pharynx is the opening to the digestive system. Okay, so if we look at these organisms, one of their characteristics, their traits, is, is that they are readily um, they have their ability to regenerate their body parts. And they can actually reproduce asexually by pulling themselves apart. So they can actually attach the pharynx to a substrate and then pull their bodies apart so that they can 
pull into two to get two individuals. And that's what is actually being shown here. And if we look at this marine flatworm right here, this is a marine flatworm um, getting ready to pull itself apart. Now, these are sometimes confused with sea slugs, but these are flats. And so when we look at sea slugs, they're very colorful and, um, and um, very diverse, but they're not flats. So sometimes in Google, they confuse them. I see flatworms all the time called slugs, but they're not the flatworms. So you can cut them experimentally and get kind of interesting uh, things happening. So sometimes you can you could cut the head and the tail regenerate. If you cut just right, you could actually get two heads. So like if you cut right there, it might get confused and form two different heads, two different tails. In this section, they regenerated. Actually, this one's regenerating right. All these are regenerating right. But sometimes you can get regeneration that occurs and it's it's not quite correct if you cut them experimentally. Okay. So those are the free living ones. This is another example of a free living one. We do not have uh, terrestrial flatworms up north. This is actually from Asia, but it is in, um, getting into Florida via the plant trade. So when Asian plants come in with soil, oftentimes there's lots of eggs and larvae in that soil. And so the Floridians, you know, are experiencing these flatworms that are in their soil and they actually attack earthworms. And so they'll actually try to eat an earthworm by secreting digestive enzymes out of its pharynx and then kind of sucking up the juices that it creates. And so this would be a non-native species to North America, kind of an invasive species. And they're trying to figure out how to keep them out because we don't want them here. Okay, so let's look at the characteristics of endoparasites in general. So endoparasites um, tend to be hermaphroditic. And this means that they can produce both egg and sperm. Not all organisms that are hermaphroditic are parasites. Our earthworms that we have, they're also hermaphrodite. So an earthworm is both male and female. But with her hermaphrodism, you can have self-fertilization. or cross-fertilization. So if you think about it, if you have one tapeworm inside of your body, it, in order for it to produce eggs, it's gonna have to produce egg and sperm, right? Fertilized eggs is gonna have to produce. If you have two tapeworms, it would be really nice if they could swap egg and sperm, right? Or actually swap sperm. So that would be cross-fertilization. But oftentimes the parasites become isolated into their hosts. And so self-fertilization would be really an advantage to being an endoparasite. So the other thing is, is that they have complex life cycles. And the reason why they have these complex life cycles is, is that if I'm a parasite and I'm in the host, how am I going to get to another host? So this has to do with dispersal. How do I get out of my host? How do I get my offspring out of my host and into another host? And so these life cycles oftentimes include two different species where the primary host has the adult stage and then the secondary host has the larval stage. Okay, so the primary host as the adult parasite, and then the secondary host has the larval parasite. 
And sometimes it's even more. Sometimes you might have a third. And we'll, I'll give you an example of that. OK, so let's look at the example of the tapeworm. Oh, not the tapeworm, sorry. <laughs> but let's look at the lancelet liver fluke. This is like the most complicated life cycle because we actually have three hosts. This is primarily in Europe, um, in European cows, goats, and sheep. So the adult, let's just put it in the cow, the adult resides in the bile duct, which is near the liver. So we'll just put the adult resides in bile duct. So that's close to the intestine where all the nutrients are. Here, the eggs are released with the feces. So we'll put fertilized eggs. These are eaten by a snail. And unfortunately, once they're eaten by a snail, the eggs um, hatch out, and then the larvae kind of just burrow out of the snail. And they leave the snail, and they're found in what are referred to as slime balls. So the larvae leave the uh, slime balls. Okay. So the whole point of this complicated life cycle is to get the larvae into another cow, right? So how are we going to do that? So generally cows do not eat snails, right? So it wouldn't be a good idea to have just your uh, larvae in the snail. So we need the larvae to leave this, the snail and then they're eaten by ants. Okay, so we still have the problem of the cow having to eat the ants in order to get the larvae. So cows generally eat the tops of the grasses. So they're generally not down on the ground where the ants are. And so the larvae, the parasite, is going to change the behavior of the ant. So we're going to say at night, ants crawl to the tips of the grasses. And wait to be eaten. So they're kind of like zombie ants. Okay? So the parasite has taken over their behavior. The ants do not go back to the colony at night like most ants do. And so only those infected actually do this behavior. Okay? And so interestingly, if they're not eaten, then during the day they act like a normal ant. And then at night they do the same behavior. And so what this behavior does is it increases the likelihood that the larvae is going to get back into the inside of a cow, right? So the cow eats the ant. And then the adult develops in the bile duct. So you have this crazy, crazy life cycle. And the purpose of it is to disperse the parasites offspring to other individuals. So if we look at this in an image, right, this is actually the Center for Disease Control. The reason why the Center for Disease Control is really interested in this, it's human disease, is, is that occasionally life cycles can go awry, right? They can not, it doesn't work, right? So occasionally, humans can eat ants, right? So if the human eats the ants, then they can actually get an adult fluke in their bile duct that is not supposed to be there.
Okay, so let's look at another example. So let's look at the tapeworm. So this is a fluke. It, the fluke still has its digestive tract um, and it kind of attaches onto the bile duct and then feeds. Okay, tapeworms are different. So we're gonna look at the adult tapeworm, the human tapeworm. So the adult resides in the human intestine. Now, it doesn't have a digestive tract, but it does have an organ of attachment. So it attaches via a structure called the scolex. So the scolex is the, uh, the structure of attachment, and so it's got hooks and suckers. And it kind of looks like it might be the head, the mouth, but there's no mouth. So the adult produces packages of eggs. So the eggs, again, this is a really common endoparasite. The eggs leave with the feces. Okay. These eggs on, in this particular instance, are eaten by a pig. because pork tapeworms are actually the most common worldwide. We also have uh, tapeworms that are found in cows, in all, in all the organisms in fish, all the organisms that we eat, but we're gonna use the pig example. So it's eaten by a pig, and then the larvae insists in the skeletal muscle. Why not insist in like the liver or why not insist in the brain? Why insist in the skeletal muscle? Because that's what we eat, right? We like the muscle because it's high in protein. So we eat the skeletal muscle, right? And then this is eaten by a human. Undercooked pork and then it can get into the, um, the intestine where it resides. And so they can live long-term in the intestine. Interestingly, you can't like, you don't go from having one tapeworm to a hundred tapeworms because look at, it has to go through this life cycle. So you can have one tapeworm for 10 years, right? Before it dies, I don't think they live very long, but I, mean, I don't think they live your entire life with you. But it can die, right? Or because you, it has to go through this life cycle to get so to get another tapeworm, right? We have to eat another insistent. You can eat multiple, in, you know, larvae. But this is why they inspect meat because they're looking for this, right? Meat inspectors look to see if and hope to see, and then they also tell you to cook your meat because that will kill the the larvae. So this is actually a really common tapeworm that causes uh, problems when people start to have seizures, because what happens is, is that the, um, the humans mistakenly ingest the eggs and like maybe the food hasn't been washed and then um, it can get into, it can cyst into the human body. But this is a diagram that shows the life cycle of the, um, the normal life cycle. So this is the scolex right here. Okay. So if we look at CDCs, right? So if you accidentally ingest um, the eggs, then the larvae are in the wrong host, right? They expected to be in a pig, but then now they're in a human. And so the larvae migrate throughout the body and they can exist in different parts of the body. So here you can see that it can exist in the eye. It can also exist in the lungs and it can also exist in the brain. So you might have seen videos on YouTube where you know people are having seizures and then they do an MRI scan of the brain and they're like, oh my God, there's a larval tapeworm insisted in the brain, right? 
and they can actually go in and cut them out and remove them. In many cases, the person is able to survive. But that could be a, um, a source of, of having seizure just is that you have that larval tapeworm that got into the wrong host, didn't know where to go, and so it insisted in the brain. Okay, so that's probably relatively uncommon in the United States, right? But if you went abroad, that would be more at risk. But in the United States, we have cats and dogs, right? So interestingly, when you look at the cat and the dog um, paper and life cycle, you can see that their secondary host is a flea. So that's kind of crazy. So the eggs are released. Right, into the environment from the cat, and then the flea eats the, eats the um, egg, and then the dog eats the flea, and then he gets a tapeworm. And so sometimes this can go bad, like for example, if you are a person and you let your dog, I guess this is more common in children, so if you let your dog lick your face, like he's been grooming and he's like picking his skin right, and then he licks your face, you can accidentally ingest a flea that has um, the larval form of the tapeworm, and then you can actually get a dog tapeworm. So that's why the um, veterinarian, you know, is like, well, we probably should worm your animal so that they don't have tapeworms. And then they obviously want you to make sure that you keep pick up the feces so it doesn't lay around, um, because that can also be, that's where the eggs are. Right? And so that can also spread the disease. And so I think that's a really cool um, life cycle with the flea. I mean, you would think it would be more like a mouse, right? As cat or birds. There are probably other tapeworm species where their mice and birds are the intermediate hosts. So when we look at the diversity of tapeworms, we actually can look at the diversity of the scolex. So when they look at a tapeworm, they can identify the species by looking at the scolex. And so this could be like a tapeworm. I think I want to drop this off the internet. This is a tapeworm that uses a frog as its adult host. And so notice that its scolex is very different shaped than, say, for example, the tapeworm that's found in pork and uses the cumin as its primary host. So species diversity in tapeworms and, and being able to identify them might come down to that. But obviously, what host you get them from is the food as well. Okay, so I'm going to stop there for today. Or do you guys have any questions? Okay, so remember that we have lab at 2. So I'll go open up the lab. We're going to be um, doing some experiments on millipedes. And then we're also going to be doing a squid dissection today as kind of an introduction to animal anatomy and structure and behavior.